It's down at Rector Arena. <laughs> so, seismic risk mitigation. This has been a popular dining topic between my friends these days. I mean, a lot of us might be interested in seismic risk mitigation. This is a different, I mean, structural engineering. Normally, people don't want to know what I do for a living. But here, seismic risk mitigation, here we go. Some say this is a $10 billion problem for New Zealand. Too expensive, we can't afford it. But some say this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us to reduce the seismic risk in our built infrastructure. The purpose of my talk today, hopefully, is to, set, to share some aspects of my work in seismic risk mitigation, and perhaps you can then share your dining conversations with your friends and family. If each of us have some increased awareness of seismic risk and what we do to mitigate this risk, I believe we are going a long way towards creating a resilient New Zealand. My journey on seismic risk mitigation really began in Christchurch. This is a picture of me and Grand Chancellor the day after the earthquake with Professor Ken Elwood. We are, first, we are the two first engineers to actually look at what happened to the building. The sheer wall on the ground floor that collapsed and the building was on the lean. This experience, coupled with my PhD research, which I just finished prior to the earthquake, luckily, really broadened my eyes on what buildings would do in an earthquake. It really taught me a lot about the uncertainty of what building may do and the, the force of nature, really. And it's with, on the grounding of the experience I had in Christchurch, I spent about five months in the CBD looking at different, different buildings, uh, inspecting buildings, both for research and emergency response. And my PhD that I come to Baker to work on seismic risk mitigation project. You might ask at this point, what does it mean, you know, seismic risk mitigation? It really en en encapsulate a number of activities, really. Two, two of which is seismic assessment, where we assess the risk of a particular building. We, we may look at a building and understand what's its behavior under earthquakes, and then make a judgment of the risk of, for that building, for the building occup occupants. And from then, we inform the owner, and we give an advice to the owner about what they can do to mitigate that risk. So that's kind of the two, two components to it. And obviously, retrofit, what it means is when the owner had a, had a, had a advice of risk from us, for example, they might decide to do something about it. They might demolish the building, they might sell it to someone else and let someone else take care of the risk, or they might strengthen the building or retrofit the building. So that's kind of the second part of the activity. I like this slide here. I don't know whether you guys can see it from the back. It really highlighted two peculiarity with seismic risk mitigation projects. First of all is we can't predict earthquakes. It may happen today, somewhere in, in the world, it may happen 50 years from now. We might know something about probability of when it may happen. Is it one in 100 years, one in 1,000 years fault? But ultimately, we can't predict when it happens. So the uncertainty of earthquakes. And the second point this cartoon may show is the human reaction to this risk. We do not know. We, we can't handle risks that we can't control very well as a, as a human. So you know, some of us might decide to ignore it. Earthquake will never happen in Christchurch. You know, we don't have faults underneath us. So it really reflects on the, the, the two pertinent problems. As my good friend Brandon, the second speaker, they're going to come along and tell us all about predicting the, the difficulty, the challenges and uncertainty in predicting ground motion under, underneath us. I put it to you. My job then is to plunge a building on top of that and to understand, given all the challenges under the ground and all, the cha all, all what we know and do not know about the building, I have to make an assessment of the risk and then inform my client and my client would take my, my advice to make a multi-million multi dollar decision. So from, from my experience working in this risk, uh, seismic risk mitigation projects, it really shifted my viewpoint from being just a structural engineer to more a consultant, where we leverage our engineering expertise to help our client to make informed decisions. So that's... And seismic assessment, one of the principal activities of, uh, of, of this work it's a bit like playing doctor with building. So it's like when, when, when you go see a doctor for the first time, the doctor might look at you and see you know, whether you're blue, green that day, whether you're coughing. We might know a bit about the building, how tall it is, where it is located, is in Wellington or Auckland. But often we do not know a lot about what's underneath the ground. What's actually, is there a fault nearby? What's the material uh, strength? What's the reinforcing content? So there's a lot of uncertainty in assessing a building. So, like a doctor, structure engineer apply our tools to it and our analysis to it to create 
really to make a judgment at the end of the day on what's the performance of this building. This next chart here, I like this because I'm an engineer. All of us engineers like flow chart. And really this described the process of seismic risk mitigation going from left to right. You, you can take my medical analogy and apply it to the chart really. If you imagine at the beginning of the process, we, we do, us engineers, structural engineers do some sort of screening procedure, what we call the initial evaluation procedure. It's a bit like you going to a doctor and they, as I said, do a screening. They may ask you a few questions, go through some checkbox, okay, he's not coughing, he's not having a fever, so it's good. On, on the basis of some visual inspection and some high level screening uh, tool, we have to make a judgment whether the building is sick, the building is healthy, or somewhere in between. If the client then would like to know more about the building, we might go into the next phase, what we call engineering evaluation. In this case, for a structural engineer, it may be uh, digging, digging a borehole on the ground to understand what's the ground condition. We might create a 3D model of the building and put uh, earthquake motion to it and see what, what it does. So we can do all sorts of fancy analysis, but ultimately we have to make an assessment of the seismic risk. And if you like, for a doctor, it's a bit like asking you to do blood tests and x-ray. And lastly, if the seismic risk is deemed too high, what we call earthquake prone building, the owner may elect to strengthen the building or demolish, as I mentioned. So if they decide to strengthen, then they might call the structural engineer again to provide a solution for them. And the way I see is earthquake strengthening, it's a bit like playing surgery on a building because we are, we're trying to remove the weakness point and strengthen, strengthen it. Like a doctor, the, the realm of structural assessment is really highly uncertain. If you go to structural engineer A, structural engineer B, you might actually get slightly different opinion. So the challenge for the profession and for my team in Becker is really to get it right consistently. F for the past four years, I've been working with ANZ Bank with their seismic assessment, uh, seismic risk mitigation across New Zealand. We have worked from building, or I have worked with building from Kaitaia all the way to Invercargill, as you can see in this map here. We have looked at high rise in Auckland, Wellington, in the urban centres, to small historic buildings like this beautiful uh, Omaru National Bank. <coughs> to deliver this package of work, I have to manage Becker structural resources across New Zealand, all the way from Dunedin, Christchurch, Wellington, New Plymouth, Taranga, Hamilton, here in Auckland. Managing such a large team of people to the same client require a lot of effort to get the communication right and consistent. It's really tested my project management skill to get everything correct so that a report from my team in Christchurch will look exactly the same from Hamilton. And more importantly, the quality of the technical output have to be consistently right. I'm the Becker job manager for that. I'm the principal client uh, relationship manager as well, as well as the lead structure engineer for all the assessment and retrofit. For part of this job, we have, this is one of, the, uh, one of the big portfolio work that we have done within Becker as I joined this is subsequent to the earthquake. We have developed a number of processes and tools that we use uh, for, for delivering the project. A number of these tools and processes were subsequently extended to a number of Becker projects. Uh, the innovation that we have developed, the knowledge that we have, we have done uh, was captured. I personally written a number of guidelines, like one, what I call the starter guide for seismic assessment, really for dummies, so that we got fresh engineers coming from uni who have not have any training on assessing buildings, they get, they get a starter guide and we, we help them through it. So capturing those knowledge, both for Baker and then sharing it with the wider industry is something I'm very passionate about. <coughs> I'll share two, just time's sake, two little uh, issues that often crop up when we do seismic risk mitigation. One is what I call client dilemma, and secondly, the technical challenges. Every client may aspire to strengthen their building. You know, nobody really wants to live in a poor building, but often, there's various dilemma. It costs too much. Like today, new my manager told me, his client tell him, earthquake strengthening is a bit like throwing money into the sea. It doesn't really improve the value of the building sometimes, but if you don't do it, the building devalue. Some client may aspire to have a, a high level of health and safety. For, for, for example, ANZ Bank. The health and safety of their staff and their customer is paramount. However, they got other pressing needs about capital, about security, business continuity, and, uh, and really the, the branch network themselves. So there's a lot of things playing around. And with technical challenges, hopefully with the next two examples, we get the idea what, what we have to deal with, 
both the engineering part of it as well as the non-engineering part of it. This is a good example just down at Fanshawe Street here. Uh, DNZ Property is the owner, it's my client. Where the client dilemma really drives the engineering solution. Here, my client, are given as part of a lease negotiation, four months really to strengthen or upgrade the building seismic performance to a particular level. We have four months to assess the building, to understand what's the problem, to design a solution that, that mitigate that problem, and then to get a consent, get a peer review, and get it constructed. Mission impossible. So, and then the second pressing dilemma, that's one tenant. The other tenant in the building doesn't want anything to do with it. They do not want to be interrupted. They do not want noise or dust. So we are limited to where we can strengthen the building. Our engineer responds to that problem. We have found a 1.2 meter wide service riser in the building. So the service engineer will like me because that's you can see is congested with ducts and pipes and so forth. So that's the only place we can find the building where actually nobody will complain. We can, we can, we can strengthen the building there. And the solution we have elected here is the use of fiber reinforced polymer. It's a bit like a wallpaper type material. It's wet uh, and, and, and soft when you, when you wet it. You can apply it to the wall, but it's as strong as steel. So that was the solution we used there. The client was happy, the tenant was happy. The challenge of using fiber reinforced polymer is there's no New Zealand standards to this kind of technology. It's actually not commonly used. As such, I have to benchmark my design to international standards to satisfy both the peer review and Auckland Council. The second example, I don't know how many people from Auckland might recognize this building, is the Memorial Chapel at King's College at Otahu. It's certainly one of the most beautiful buildings I've worked in in New Zealand. If you've not seen it, I recommend you go, you know, pay a visit. As you can see, it's an unreinforced masonry building. It's a heritage category one building and it's designed by uh, R.A. Abbotts, a prominent architect here in Auckland. So to understand the behavior of this cathedral-like chapel, it's highly complicated. We have to rely on tools that we have. I have to do computer model all the way to simplified analysis to really understand what's happened. Thank goodness for this building, as part of the long-term progressive strengthening, if you like, that implemented by, by the college, the building was strengthened in the 1990s, and we, we, we get to have a chance to understand what was done then, and I have to back calculate what is the capacity of it today. So there's a lot of work to go to to understand the heritage, the history of the building, back to my doctor analogy, to really understand what was done to it, because the engineer who worked on it no longer in Becker. Going forward, we did propose to the one thing I should mention, the chapel for the King's College is an is a utterly important cultural institution. It is to commemorate all the old boys that died in World War I. So for the King's College, it's a, one of the very important pieces of heritage for them. So going forward, we did we, we're putting forward a retrofit solution, really both to elevate the life safety performance and also to give the building a fighting chance to be repaired and safe post-earthquake. What we're proposing is to implement um, vertical post tensioning rods, so these are like high strength steel that clamp the top of the building to a new foundation at the bottom. So it kind of allowed the building to rock backwards and forward in an earthquake in both directions. So it's kind of new technology, it's very similar to what I've done for my PhD uh, with reinforced concrete. So hopefully that will be implemented at some stage. In conclusion, I believe the seismic risk mitigation projects that I've done have created more resilient buildings across New Zealand to various community. I'm truly grateful that these projects, Becker, my employer, and my clients have given me the, the opportunity to learn. I've developed, grown, both as a consultant, as a structural engineer, and as a person. So I'd like to thank my client here for giving the permission, really, for me to talk about their project. It's really their glory to, to get all these things done. My experience in Becker in the past four years and my, my, my before that have really led me to that really difficult to pronounce committee. Uh, the, the Earth, really is the Earthquake Society Technical Study Group that we are writing, rewriting the guideline on how to assess and, and retrofit building, this design standards for the future. So I'm, I'm really privileged to be in the, in, the, in the crowd of really prominent structural engineers. And it's, I see it as my chance to give back to industry and the society and also a top leadership in that area. The society places a lot of trust on structural engineer with regard to building safety. When you enter a building, you will not think twice that the building is safe because of the implicit trust society have on structural engineer. Is this trust 
that drive me to work hard every day, go to work and do my bit to create a better and more resilient New Zealand. My challenge to you all today as you leave is, what would you do differently following my talk today? You know, would you ask for better buildings? Like all goods in a supply and demand economy, if there's no demand for seismic risk mitigation, nothing will be done. With that, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Cam, Thanks, for a very, very interesting presentation. Now we've got a few minutes left for some questions. <coughs> would you like to ask Cam a question? Don't be shy. Oh, thanks, Ken. That was a very interesting and uh, entertaining presentation. In the news recently, they talked about the fact that they're studying the faults down in, in the west coast in the South Island. I'm just wondering if that type of study is going to help you reshape the way we think and do seismic um, assessment, or is it, or are earthquakes just um, a different way of, of a, uh, unpredictable nature, and we never know enough to do enough about it? Thanks for the question. So the question there is, there's ongoing research on seismicity in New Zealand. And I think the reference there is on the news where they're drilling down Alpine Fault in Hokitika or somewhere, down a kilometre. And whether that new knowledge were really going to shake uh, what I do in assessing old buildings. Before I came here today, as I was preparing, I did go into Herald and I saw new fault discovered in Wellington along the harbour. Just today announced. I guess it's kind of similar. The reality is, Earth, you know, we structural engineer, earthquake engineer operating in New Zealand, we are constantly facing with new knowledge about seismicity, faults and earthquakes. It's really an ongoing lesson for structural engineer. So how does that impact on the work we do? It's really an evolving knowledge and we always have to be up to date with what's latest and greatest really because the science is always going to catch up with us. And the role of engineer is really to keep an eye on science, realising what's coming, but really at the end of the day we have to used our judgment and our tools available to us to make decisions because at the end of the day, unlike scientists, engineers is about creation, it's about making things happen. So hope that answered your question. Anyone else? I've got a question. Oh, thanks, John. Obviously you concentrated on, on the structural side of seismic assessment. Yep. I was wondering whether you get involved at all with the non-structural elements or do you give advice to clients on it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's a very topical question. So the question there is, we're, we're looking at buildings, the, the bones of a structure. In a building, there's many known, what we call non-structural elements like ceiling, light, the fan, the windows, the services, the plant that is critical to the function of a building. Am I right? Mm -hmm. so, Yes, a lot of my clients have been asking the question, what do we do about non-structural uh, elements of building? One thing we need to understand is the New, Ze New Zealand legislation, particularly the earthquake prone legislation in Parliament currently, is very much focuses on life safety, prevention of fatality and death. So that's the focus of the compliance side and that's one subset of, of client. But there's other clients of Becker, the institution client, the hospital, they're really keen to know if a big earthquake happened tomorrow, can my facility continue to function and provide a service to the, mm -hmm. to the society, Con especially hospital, transpower, as we've seen the past week? So there is that sort of question and that we do do some work in that, that space. However, it is an ongoing uh, area because as we observe in Wellington, in Christchurch, the, the signs behind it, the injuring practice behind it is still highly variable. Some contractor does it, some engineers think about it, in large cases, people don't pay too much attention to it. So it's, it's going to be an area that we, we need to work on more yeah, no, going forward. Yeah. Hey, anyone else? No? Cool. Very good. Thank you, Cam. Thanks, John. Thank you.